Decolonization of Africa following World War II brought independence to many countries, but also a lot of violence in the form of civil wars, insurgencies and the like. Entire generations of young men were called upon to take part in various military efforts. My guest today was very much part of that. He spent many years fighting for the South African Defence Forces and he has a particular, particularly unique story to tell. Vainant Dutoy, welcome to Tales Less Told. Thank you, Richard. Now, Vainant, in 1985, you were a young fellow. You were the son of a farmer. You could have been on the farm. You could have been at a bar with some buddies. But instead, you were in a submarine lying in wait off the Angolan coast. What were you doing there? Enjoying the scenery. Oh, yeah. But, uh, okay, now, first off, Richard, I would like to say that uh, I'm uh, not part of the decolonization since the F World War II. I'm not that older. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, things uh, did rapidly uh, change uh, since 1960 in Africa. And there was a few countries that were sort of holding out, uh, which uh, the main ones were uh, basically uh, Portugal, with the Portuguese col uh, colonies, which was just north of, of our territories. Uh, we received, uh, after the First World War, uh, a mandate, a so-called sea mandate, to protect and uh, look after uh, Southwest Africa, which later on became Namibia. And uh, when the Portuguese left Angola, there was a big uh, vacuum created, and uh, we had all the uh, Swapu uh, fighters, uh, the plan fighters, the people for the libera uh, liberalization, the People's Army for the liberal uh, liberalization of, of, of Namibia, sorry for that one, but I'm actually Afrikaans, but uh, so, so they just moved in and, and we had to protect the borders, protect the farmers and uh, it was of course a war that touched uh, every family in South Africa uh, it was not a war that we wanted initially, but it was a war that, that was forced upon us. Uh, first initiated uh, on request by the United States to involve uh, ourselves in Angola uh, after the withdrawal of the Portuguese uh, to support the pro-Western group of rebels, which was UNITA uh, under Dr. Jonas Savimbi. And uh, uh, eventually we got caught up in this war uh, back home. Uh, we uh, introduced national service, uh, which was uh, then lengthened to a, a time period of, of two years that every uh, white South African had to do national service. Uh, it became so part of, of our family life and uh, the way how you do things that uh, for us, it was something to look forward to. When we were youngsters, we wanted to go. We wanted to go into the military. And the military at that stage offered a, a very good career. You talked about growing up on the farm, and I could have uh, gone uh, to the farm. But uh, being one of three brothers, only one can farm. Mm. And the rest got to do something else. Eventually, nobody of us went to the farm. Uh, but I became involved, and you ask about the uh, submarine on the west coast uh, of Africa, I eventually became part of a uh, four reconnaissance regiment, which was the seaborne uh, unit of the South African Special Forces, very much similar to the British uh, Special Boat Service, uh, the, B, the BSB, uh, in contrast with the SAS, which was the Special Air Service. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we specialized uh, in, in uh, uh, reconnaissance, infiltrating from uh, warships and especially submarines. Submarines, of course, for smaller groups of uh, teams that, that is needed, especially uh, uh, reconnaissance operations, uh, going into harbors, deploy from the submarine with rubber boats and then uh, you know, drive into the night, go and take photographs and measurements and do what we have to do. Uh, 
but that specific time that you are talking about now uh, in 1985, we were on our way to uh, destroy six massive uh, oil tanks uh, in Cabinda. Now Cabinda geographically is not part of Angola. It's a it's a it's an enclave, uh, a province of Angola, but a part of the DRC is coming between Angola mainland and then this enclave. Mm -hmm. So Cabinda got their own resistance fighters, and they are still operating today, FLAC. Uh, and they worked for the independence of Cabinda from the larger Angola. Now Cabinda is very rich in oil. And the oil there are being uh, harvested, pumped out, harvested uh, by uh, uh, the Gulf Company, Cabinda Gulf, which is an American company, United States company. We received the first time we received instructions to destroy that oil storage facility uh, uh, during 1983. Yet two years passed before we get the final go-ahead to destroy the tanks. I cannot help but to ask the question, why? Why would we attack our only ally in the Western world, their facility? Why would we anger the Americans who have been using their uh, their, their vote in the, in the Security Council of the United Nations to protect us. If you go back in history, you will see that the day after that failed attack was the day that America, America finally cut their ties with the old South Africa. I couldn't help but ask, was this operation authorized on the highest level in South Africa? or was it used to force the previous government of P.W. Boota to surrender more quickly the power. Mm -hmm. So our main uh, target at that stage was to attack the, the American oil installation in Cabinda. Uh, we infiltrated by submarine. Uh, of course, the Daphne class submarines which we used is French origin, uh, fairly old submarines, and according to uh, Jane's fighting ships and all records that they have, a submarine cannot travel that fast, or a Daphne class submarine. But of, we, the South Africans, have modified the submarine so that we can travel to there and back without a problem. And the submarine is a clandestine uh, weapon. Uh, safe to infiltrate with and is hardly seen. As long as you don't appear in the same spot for more than three nights, you, you are fairly safe. Uh, what happened then was that we infiltrated on the night of the 20th of May uh, 1985. Uh, there was two limitations put on the operation which I must first discuss. The first one was that we were not allowed to compromise the seaward capabilities of the South African Defence Force. So we, we were told not to land inside the installation because it's open on the seaside. We could have even swum in, uh, enter the facility without even cutting one fence, do our job, and be back aboard the submarine in six hours. Instead, they said we had to land in a little bay of Malembu up north, which was 21 kilometers away from the target. The, the, the gulf itself, where they produced the oil from the sea, was very shallow. Uh, average depth of, of about 22 meters, a submarine needs at least 25 meters to operate in, so we had to launch very far away from the coast. Where we normally would have launched on three sea miles off the coast, we now had to do it on 12 sea miles from the coast. So now we've got a very long leg to infiltrate by boat, 
and then we got another 21 kilometers to walk to the target, then we have to attack the target, we have to come back all the way. And there was not enough hours in the night to execute the operation. So now that forces us, or forced us, to stay one day ashore. But just remember, we were now 2,000 kilometers behind enemy lines. Mm. We are 2,000 kilometers north of the Angolan Namibian border, where the rest of the South African Defense Force was deployed at the time. So there's no assistance. No one can come to your aid. If there's a problem, you are stuck. Because in daytime, the submarine uh, uh, it's gone down to the bottom, it bottomed itself, and it was lying there, no radio communication, nothing until nightfall. So it was a risky operation. And we infiltrated as uh, we, we were told to and how we have planned. Uh, it was difficult, it was getting late. We get into the laying up position very late at night. So, uh, sorry, you, you deployed from the submarines? Yes. That's right. How many guys are we talking about? Uh, we were nine guys, uh, they deployed, <laughs> and uh, uh, there were six guys, uh, alternative, uh, or more personnel on the, on the boats, which manned the boats. Yep. Three in each boat. And uh, then the attack team, which was nine people. Uh, and, uh, yeah, eventually, of course, the guys on the boats got away. They got back to the ship the same night. And, and what, what was your role? Uh, I was the mission commander. Mission commander. Okay. Yeah. What, what rank does that equal in the uh, I was a major, a, a captain, captain. A captain, sorry. I became a major shortly afterwards. I was a captain at that stage. Yeah. Just um, one, one more question about that. Um, you didn't want to betray, or rather the, your higher-up powers said that they didn't want to betray the seaward capabilities of the South African Navy. Therefore, it had to look like a, you came in from land somehow. Yes. So, was the was the enemy meant to think that you had parachuted in or something or other? Yeah, the cover story was that we parachuted into uh, um, Zaire, which was which now the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and uh, uh, as the crow flies, is seventy five kilometers from the border, because the enclave is long, and and actually very small. It's in total, I think, 125 kilometers from north to south and 75 from, e from east to west. So uh, the cover story was we parachuted into uh, uh, Zaire, we crossed the border into uh, 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 Kabinda uh, from the east and then we walked to the facility. And that's why the second uh, 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 limitation that was put on the operation is that we must lay the up, our, our, our height for the day must be on the eastern side of the installation to create that impression. But the eastern side of the installation only had one proper place where you can hide. So all this, the two limitations, the one limitation forced us to spend the day ashore. We could have done this operation in six hours. Max, mm. forced us to stay a day ashore. The second limitation put us in a spot. There's already three questions that need to be asked. Why American target? Why so isolated? Why a day ashore? Why on the eastern side? Okay, two more questions. Um, was it meant to be a deniable operation? If the things blow up and everyone's saying, who did this? Of course. And who, what was, was the idea that, oh, it must have been UNITA? Uh, yes. We had a lot of UNITA pamphlets with us and uh, all UNITA equipment, UNITA uniforms oh, okay. and everything was okay. UNITA. Uh, UNITA was to take the, the honors for this operation. Uh, of course, that was in the eyes of, of the soldiers we, mm. who have planned it, but there were certain alter, uh, alternative motives behind everything. Uh, but, of course, the South African government in, immediately denied it and they said, well, we are actually on a, on a uh, uh, 
reconnaissance mission to find out more about SWAPU and ANC bases okay. uh, in Kabinda, which we knew before the time is not the case anyway. There's, right. there's, there's no one of them in Kabinda itself. But yes, uh, the target was the oil tanks. And in, and in terms of the planning, <coughs> excuse me, the planning, you said that there were those two uh, provisos that you had to work, work towards. Who were those? Who was dictating those rules to you? Well, it came to us uh, through the intelligence lines, uh, military intelligence, who uh, uh, gave certain uh, uh, guidelines for the operation of what they want to do, and uh, uh, of course, uh, all the photographs, everything that we used in the operation, come, uh, came from them as well. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, there was um, the, the situation where the, 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 what's the right word? But the, the selection of the height, the position of the height, is my priority. Mm. And under normal circumstances, we will decide, I will decide where we lay up. But I was told by Chief of the Defence Force that I will lay up on the eastern side. The Chief of the Defence Force? Yeah. Oh. I was told that I, you guys will lay up on the eastern side mm. and they have actually indicated the place where we did lay up. But that was an isolated spot. And this is perhaps one of the very few operations where we were absolutely 100% dictated about where to, to spend the day. Mm. And that is what raised questions in my mind all the years after, uh, you know, after the mm, completion mm. of the operation, after the guys came back, after I came back uh, from, from, from prison. Yep. That was the questions I asked and I never had the answers on that. So, so in the, all those early planning stages you have your nine fellows of the, the assault team and the other guys who are involved in the um, who were also part of the broader team. Was there a feeling of unease in those yes. planning and preparation stages? Uh, that yes. something didn't feel quite right? Uh, definitely. Uh, especially the fact that we had to spend a day ashore. We wanted to go in and out. Into the, uh, the, the installation, the oil installation, and out that way. Without cutting one single fence. That's what we wanted to do. That was the logical thing to do. Uh, I also afterwards thought about it. When we attacked the, the Beira oil installations in Mozambique, we landed inside the installation. When we attacked the oil installation in Luanda, we landed inside the installation. Lubitu inside. When we attacked Namib Harbor in 1986, the guys, they went into the harbor. Why was that same limitation, not part of those other operations. Were those Why specific this operation? Was the Cabinda enclave the furthest the, of the all of those up north, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Lots of questions there, but let's go back to the operation. Itself. Yeah, lots of questions. But anyway, we moved into position quite late uh, during the night. And uh, we walked through a lot of grass that was wet, dew, wet. And you could, ex could actually saw our, our approach. You can see it in the, saw it in the grass. Uh, which for many years led the impression that we were too late. That's why there's a dew print. But recently, recent years, I've been farming in that area and I find out that the dew already start uh, appearing on the grasses from 11 at night, 11, 12 at night. So uh, here is also a thing uh, that we were not prepared, I think, to operate under those conditions, uh, uh, those uh, humidity, those wet uh, climate. Uh, we were not prepared, we did not know how late does the deal fell, mm. and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the, when the sun came up that morning, when uh, we looked out of the height, we could see uh, at least two Fabla camps. 
which wasn't there during the reconnaissance. So now I start asking the question, why did it took two years from when I first received the order to do it, why did it took two years before we finally executed? What had to come into place? Just something to bear in mind. Okay, so FAP FAPLA? Um, FAPLA bases, they, yes. They were part of the MPLA organization? Yeah, FAPLA is the hmm. forces of Maras, Paralibera, Saudi, Angola, which is the military wing of the MPLA. Okay, and these guys were um, heavily supported by, uh, by the Soviet Union and, and Cuba and the like, is that right? Especially by the Cubans. Especially by the Cubans. Uh, the Cubans, in fact, were mostly their, their leader group, the guys yep. that led it, they set up uh, their operations, their planning, their defense, was all done by Cubans. So after I was captured, I was kept in the Cuban military prison okay. in Luanda. So I, I have never had contact with Angolans when I was in prison, only contact with Cubans. Okay. Right, you're jumping ahead there because yeah. no one knows up to this point yeah. that you've been captured. However, so 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 just to just to go back, you've deployed, you've you've um, you've walked 21 kilometres to the lying up position mm. through um, through uh, long grasses and yeah, yes, partly, partly so. But then we followed the main road. Mm -hmm. We were star road, so we walked on the side of the road. So mm -hmm. there was no problems or, uh, as far as that is concerned. Quite easily. Yep. Uh, until we left the road, had to go to the east and approach from the east so that it can throw the people off track. Once they start looking at the tracks, we are coming in from the east. Yep. Uh, but that morning we saw all those places uh, from our height. So the whole day we was uh, uh, very worried about uh, the situation. We realized that uh, they, the chances that they will pick us up are quite good. Mm. So we were counting down the hours. Were you? Uh, physically counting down the hours because we knew we can only move when it's once it's dark. Then we can get out. We cannot get out in the middle of the day because we are completely cut off. Was the plan to um, continue with the mission? We probably would have continued with the mission, yes. Yeah. yeah. And so you but at, 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 at about a quarter to five that afternoon, uh, the FAPLA forces, they swept through through the bushes that where our hide were. And, they were, and then we hit contact. So they pushed us into the open, and we moved along the edge of, of, of this jungle bush, that uh, stretch, and then we went into a, a, a stopper group of theirs. We went back into the bush, and that's where we split up. Okay, so there was what, like a platoon's worth of, of FAPLA guys? No, more like a company plus. Really? Yeah. Okay. And what were they armed with and what were you armed with? Well, we were mainly armed with silenced weapons because we are doing a raid on, on this oil installation. So we, uh, during an operation like that, you actually just use it if you are detected and to keep somebody quiet. We had two unsilenced weapons with, uh, with us, only two, two AK-47s. And of course, the FAPLAS was armed with the RPD machine uh, normal section machine gun, uh, AKs, and uh, uh, RPG-7s. Okay, so you were heavily outgunned. Yeah, we were. Yeah. Right from the start, we were outgunned. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, you can, you, you can uh, fire as many shots with a silenced weapon as you want. You're not going to win the firefight because the guy that's making the most noise that is actually winning the firefight. Uh, I remember when we, 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 we were moving back uh, one RPG-7 came right past us, he hit the ground between us, exploded. In, in my mind, I can still see the tail fin of the RPG you know, tumbling through the sky, landed in front of us. And uh, in those initial stages of contact, we had two guys that was already wounded, uh, but they kept up at that stage. And uh, when, uh, when we draw fire again, we moved back into the bush. And that's when we noticed a small ditch-like depression in the earth that leads to a next number of, of, of trees and forest and stuff. So uh, uh, we decided to try to get out that way. Uh, myself and uh, uh, 
uh, Louis van Bouda and Roland Liebenberg. Uh, we, we went that way. Had you agreed to split up into smaller groups to we at this point? We were divided before the time in smaller groups, but yeah. we have stayed together uh, until that time. Mm. Uh, when we noticed this depression, we start moving. We thought that the world group is going to follow behind. Eventually, it was just our team. And then we contact again. And both the two guys were killed and I was uh, shot four times, wounded four times. And uh, yeah, then I was captured there. Do and you have many memories of that, that moment? Uh, yes, I do, but uh, you have to go in your, almost in your subconscious mind to relive that, it's, and that's not nice. Uh, but of course it was, uh, I remember the fourth time they shot me was after I was taken prisoner. Uh, from a distance about this, this far from my face, the AK. Then a guy wants to cut my throat with, with, uh, with a knife, or an AK bayonet, uh, and he was stopped by the, the Oaken command. Uh, and that's when they realized, listen, but this guy is not black people, this is white people. Uh, they changed the scenario very quickly and they wanted to get me out of this combat area as quickly as possible. Who, uh, did you hear, were you able to detect who they thought you were? Did they think you were South Africans or uh, mercenaries? Mercenaries. Or? Oh really? Yeah, okay. mercenaries. Uh, uh, the, uh, the two guys that was with me were th already dead at that stage and the other guys was just about uh, 50 meters away in the thick bush where they waited out. But now there was a lot of confusion uh, in the ranks of the enemy as well. They didn't know exactly, is there guys that has already passed? Are we the tail part or are we the first part? So they did not continue their search for the rest of the guys at that stage. At least it delayed this action uh, long enough for darkness to fall. Mm. And then after darkness, those uh, other six guys, they got out. They went uh, to the emergency RV area where they were picked up by, by, by the rubber boats, taken back to the submarine, uh, where the doctor uh, operated on, on the two wounded guys. Both of them made it. And uh, they came back for three consecutive nights afterwards to try and find us to see whether we have perhaps reached the, the emergency mm. RV spots. So they came back. Uh, we, we said a lot of the guys. But uh, yeah, by that time uh, we were gone, uh, taken to uh, Cabinda, uh, the capital of the province of Cabinda. Uh, that was very difficult because that said my hands were tied and I was loaded on the back of a truck and at all the roadblocks they will stop and then they I'm like a trophy which they show to all the people and of course everybody wants to to get in a punch. Uh, I remember when we drove into Cabinda itself, I was thrown off the truck in a military base and uh, you t always tend to fall on your injuries. So where, where were your, where had you been shot? Uh, this arm of mine was broken, it was shot through here yeah. and then uh, uh, two shots through my shoulder and one in the neck, right. which, which, which uh, I was lucky to survive. But anyway, so I, whenever they throw you off the truck, you land on this injured shoulder. It just works that way. I remember lying there on the ground and I saw this, just this ring of army boots standing around me. Then I was uploaded again and I was taken to some official building in Cabinda lying there on a little stage, watching the blood run over the edge of, of the steps, then down the next one, down the next one. And finally, uh, the governor, I presume it was the government, uh, governor of the province and uh, the, the chief of the, the army in that province, they all arrived, they had lots of discussions. Then it was taken away where they did the, the tactical uh, interrogation. Uh, we came in, they put me on a bench and everybody leave the room. The next guy came in, they he kicked the bench out from under me and say, why are you sitting on the bench? 
The next guy will come in and say, why are you on the ground? And he kicked you back onto the bench. And then you became like a, like a, a intoxicated person. You just go with the flow. No matter what they you, do, you do or they do, you just go with it. Then, after a very long time, uh, they took me to a room under uh, lights where they started the interrogation, asking questions. But for two hours, they tried to persuade me that I do understand Portuguese, which I didn't. Or not at the time, anyway. And uh, finally, they they have uh, uh, got hold of a translator, which English wasn't very good. And uh, so now they ask me the questions through the translator. And of course, the first things they wanted to know is how did you get here, where the story of the parachutes now come in, uh, and then uh, from that, where is your emergency always? Because of, they know this guy has escaped, so where can they go and pick them up at the emergency always? So now it becomes more difficult, because all the real emergency always for this operation was next to the coast. Yeah. So I re revert back to infantry tactics, where you walk on a patrol and you will point out certain outstanding trees or land features as your emergency army. And while I was doing that, as this guy is translating, there in the corner on a steel cabinet was one Cuban sitting. And he confirmed. He said, yeah, we are doing it like that as well. So they did not ask anything more about it. So when they ask me something and I tell them infantry tactics, this guy every time confirms what I'm saying. So I realized at that stage, but I was just stuck to infantry tactics. Because here's an alibi. <laughs> He's confirming everything I'm telling them. So it, 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 it continued for a long time and... Uh, Had you received first aid? No, nothing at that stage. And uh, we are now talking about 3 o'clock the next morning, 3, 4 o'clock the next morning, when I uh, finally got the opportunity to tell this uh, uh, translator that, listen, my arm is broken. And he asked me, how do I know? I said, because you twisted it twice before they tied my hands, and it's painful. At that stage, they, 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 they sent for a doctor, the Cuban doctor. And this guy has arrived, young national serviceman from Cuba, and they checked it and they say, yes, it's broken. Then they cut my, you know, the ties around my hands, mm. and then they could see. At that moment, they took over because they demand that I now go to the hospital because they want to operate. They have to, according to them. That saved me from further interrogation. And I was loaded into an ambulance and then taken up uh, to that uh, medical post. I remember uh, lying on a steel table uh, with a single globe dangling from the roof and one guy was injecting me something on this side and the other guy was straightening this arm on a pank and I remember screaming of the pain and then I was out. When I came to the next day, sometime the next day I was actually handcuffed to a bed, hospital bed, and my whole chest was in in uh, uh, not bandages uh, when uh, you broke an arm, a cast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, interesting. Uh, about three weeks later, I I feel a terrible pain at the back. Yeah, this side here. And they came and they cut a little hole in there and they found another bullet hole which they haven't treated as yet. So they treated that. But I must take off my age to the Cuban doctors. They were also just national servicemen. The easiest way would have to put the arm off. Mm. Because they didn't have a splint for, for upper arm. They only had a, a leg splint. And they put it in here so it stick out at the top. But it saved my arm. And so they did very well in the process. 
Um, about uh, uh, seven, eight days after I was captured, I was then displayed to the international press. And uh, why do you think they did that? Say again. Why? Was that was that just the way things oh, were done? Oh, for them, could? it's uh, you must remember at that stage uh, there was supposed to be no South Africans in Angola. Okay, so you disclose that now. Yeah, um, so this is now world news. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they got proof the South Africans is in in Angola. Mm. Uh, so it was a big thing uh, internationally. But that was also the point where I know, knew or realized that now I'm safe. Because once they have displayed you to the international press, then they must protect you so that nothing happens to you. Because if something did happen to me while I was in prison, South Africa would use it to their advantage about how the Kegolans are treating the prisoners. Mm. So now I'm becoming a play ball between the two of them. Were you allowed to answer journalists' questions? At the yes, of course, but uh, you must remember that the journalists there, that was in that uh, press conference, they hate South Africans. So I had a very, very hard time to protect myself and the country in what I was saying, you know, and, uh, and the way how they were asking the questions, of course, uh, you, know, you are exporting fascism to to Angola and to the rest of Africa and uh, yeah, all the stories and things uh, which you can expect. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, um, a couple of months down the line, uh, uh, Jesse Jackson arrived in Angola. Oh. Uh, now, Jesse Jackson at that stage, he was uh, running for president uh, of the United States. And part of his election campaign, he visited uh, Africa, specifically Angola and South Africa. I can only think that he visited Angola because I was in prison there. He wanted to use this. And he also arrived there with a huge uh, journalist contingent. Uh, it's TV cameras and things and there I was sitting. And this horde of journalists asking me questions. And I really had to battle to uh, state South Africa's case. And I did that. I did that very well. But after a while, J.C. Jackson saw that, listen, this, this humiliation process that he wants to go through is not going according to plan. So now he steps forward, coming and stands right in front of me as far as this table, screaming into my face, uh, about uh, how bad person I am to be in the South Africa Defence Force and for being in Angola and things like that. So, so I got extremely upset, but we went successfully through it. And when we were driving back to the prison, I uh, was stuck between two Cubans. And the one guy was a colonel, a lieutenant colonel, and he looked at me and said, man, who the fuck is Jesse Jackson? <laughs> Sort of, he's now sympathizing with me because Jesse Jackson was trying to make uh, such a big thing of it. Mm. Uh, eventually, after I came back to South Africa in 1987, a Portuguese sculptor has made a, a sculpture for me called Prisoner of War. He said he was inspired to make that sculpture because of the interview with Jesse Jackson. Uh, I still got it. Uh, it's extremely uh, interesting. Uh, but yeah, the time in the prison, of course, was, was difficult, but difficult to accept what has happened to me. It was difficult to accept that uh, the operation has failed, that I, in fact, failed the operation, that some of my men was killed, of which one actually came here for Somerset West. Uh, he's buried here in this town. So how did you deal with that? Those, those feelings. You, well, you were in solitary confinement, is that right? Yes. Uh, for, for, for the whole period of time, I was kept in solitary confinement. And how long was the whole period? Well, that's about 835 or something days. Yeah. So almost, almost three years. Almost three years, yeah. So two and a half years or so. Two and a half years, yeah. Yeah. But 
uh, I complained about it one day and I said to the, uh, the OC of the, of the base when he came to the cell to inspect the things and uh, I said to him I want to go to a normal prison where I can have other prisoners to to communicate with. Mm. And uh, of course they refused. Uh, later on uh, I was actually glad about it because otherwise you know there's other dangers in a normal Angolan criminal prison. Mm. So in a certain sense the Cubans did not gave me bad food because I'm a prisoner. I, I was the only prisoner so I got the same food that uh, their base personnel was getting. So the food was acceptable, it was nice, you know, uh, edible, but very little. And uh, I lost 30 uh, kilograms during the time that I was in prison. Uh, that's about 40 kilometers, uh, 40 kilograms less than I'm weighing now at this stage, yeah. Okay. But anyway, I survived it and I was very glad about it eventually. Do you think your uh, training prepared you sufficiently for that? Uh, no, I don't think so. How, how do you prepare anybody to go to prison? Well, I guess uh, the initial interrogation uh, no. period. I what to start with what I will tell you. The the psychological selection of the special forces is of such a high standard that all guys that qualify in the special forces in South Africa would probably have done equally good or bad as I did in prison because of your psychological state. If you look at uh, the guys who really suffered from uh, PTSD uh, after the war, you were very, very few Special Forces guys have been affected by it. Mm. The normal troops, yes, normal Oaks, they have been for the National Service. But uh, we were psychologically better prepared. Yeah. Now, Interesting when you ask me about the training, you, you, are, you, you are only trained how to take a prisoner. The steps you go through when you take a prisoner. But that was exactly the same steps that they took with me. And while this whole thing was playing off, I kept, or kept hearing the voice of our chief instructor telling me, this is what's going to happen. Take off your boots, or his boots, and then they cut the laces off, they take off my boots. Exactly, you know, I, I could hear his voice in my head. The go now principle. Go now. If there is opportunity to escape, you must go now. Because the further along you go up the line, the less your chances to get away become but also the safer you become, mm. you understand, yep, yep. in the process. I must say uh, that thought comfort gave me some comfort, uh, the fact that I've kept on hearing this guy's voice during that whole process, uh, until almost when I went into hospital. Uh, I also knew from uh, once you have they have shown you the, to the international uh, press, then you will be safe. Uh, and that worked out that way. Uh, but for me a big problem was the fact that I, I never knew how long I was going to spend in prison. Mm -hmm. That's difficult uh, because uh, under normal circumstances you would go to a court and you, they will give you three years or five years or ten years or twenty years then at least you know and you can psychologically prep yourself for that. But being a prisoner of war, you never knew how long you are going to be there. And just remember, they never recognized me as a prisoner of war. What Did that have a positive or a negative effect? In this stage, negative. <coughs> positive, then they have to adapt to the rules of the international community. Yep. Because a prisoner of war, uh, of war got certain rights which cannot be impeached on. 
in my case, they say I'm, I, I'm not recognized as a prisoner of war because there's not a declaration of war between South Africa and Angola. Mm. But when the International Red Cross demanded from the Angolan government uh, that they do recognize me, the Angolan government said, no, we are going to do something better. We are going to invite his wife to come for a visit. So three times she visited me while I was in prison. So that's better than sticking to the, to, to the International Convention to a certain extent. So, but they played that role all the way, not not to become or not to be in the position where they they had to recognise me as a, as a person mm. of war. Did they ever find out the truth about the the mission, the fact that you were in four recce? They did no. They they did not understand the the recce stuff, the the special forces stuff. They they up to today they never knew that we went there in a submarine. They did eventually find out that we, yes, we did come from the sea, but we came by ship. Then I actually told them we came by sea, but never about the submarine. Mm. Uh, also, the fact that I was in the special forces, the implications of that, they did never realize that. So I was never questioned about special forces tactics, the way how we operate the operations that we normally do, uh, they were more interested in the operational deployment of the South African forces on the Angolan border, mm. on the Namibian side. But that I don't know, because I was deployed from the sea. So I never knew the normal uh, army deployments of the South African Defence Force along the border. Mm. Did, you, did you grow to like your captors? Now you don't like them. Uh, but the, the, you see, the moment that you start building up a sort of a position, or uh, not a position of trust, but when you start feeling, uh, or when one of the guards uh, starts displaying uh, 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 goodness mm. to you, uh, becoming... Uh, Humanity kind of... Uh, yes, <coughs> then they were normally taken away. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, so uh, never longer than three months were specific people allowed to be in contact with me, then they were swapped. Yeah. Uh, by the end of the time, the guys who was guarding me did not even know what I was doing in Angola, why I was captured. Mm. They didn't know that story. You know, it's new national servicemen that came from Cuba. But on senior level, there was uh, one specific uh, guy, I believe he was probably in psychological warfare, uh, who was in charge of the setup. He remained the same throughout. When, uh, when, we, when I left finally back for South Africa on that day when the news broke, he gave me a bottle of Cuban rum to bring back home and uh, I gave him one of the books that my wife bought, which he took to Cuba. Uh, uh, there was only one journalist ever allowed to, to talk to me while I was in, in the cell. And it was a Cuban journalist. Okay. And many years later, I'm now talking uh, in, uh, around about 2003, 2004, I received a request there's a Cuban journalist that wants to do a TV interview with me. It was the same guy. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> and then you are, uh, experience a, a sense of connection mm. with this guy because he was there under that circumstances. Mm. But looking back on the war now is so many years ago that there's no hard feelings uh, left. You know, I've been back to Angola many times, spent a lot of time with the Angolan military guys and eventually they are just soldiers exactly the same as us. It's the ideologies and politics that cause the wars and mm, sure. cause us to differ. You, you talk briefly about um, escape opportunities. Obviously you were severely injured uh, in the initial period at least. 
Um, did you keep on looking for opportunities and what would you have been prepared to do to escape? Well, uh, that was a difficult part because there's two sets of doors from the cell itself, but both are airlock systems. They have to go through one door and then through another door. And the key of that door never comes with this guy to this door. There's always an armed guard on each side. And I never knew how I was going to do it. Uh, I tried to go through the wall, break through the wall, but it was solid cast concrete, so that did not work out well. After three months, I haven't even scratched the surface properly, so I abandoned that effort. Uh, but then one night, there was a thunderstorm, a huge thunderstorm. And uh, I saw no one. And I start calling. Nothing. No one. No one in sight. So I took the, the steel chair that I got there and I start eating the bars and no one responded. And that's when I realized if there is a severe thunderstorm, there's not enough space for the guards to hide against the rain. Then they move away. Okay. So I realized that it's possible to break a lock if it happens in a storm. I, uh, I tested a couple of times and every time the same thing happened. So now I need something strong enough and long enough to have leverage to break the, you know, the padlock locks yeah. on the door. And uh, the bed was actually in a lot of parts that was screwed together. And I, I noticed that if I took off this part that is keeping the leg open and I, I'm using one of the, the legs extensions uh, and I put the two together, I got a fairly long one. So that can now work, right. Uh, but what about shoes? So uh, I start uh, threading the, the towel to make rope with it, use all the threads together. Uh, make boots out of a blanket just to protect your, boot, your, your, your feet until you can get to a place where you can get boots or take it from somebody. Uh, later on the, uh, there were some guards at night sleeping in the cell next to me. I climbed up to the top of the bus and I put my arm around. Uh, they put their stuff there on top. So I steal a magazine full of AK ammunition then I took out one round each night. So I had a lot of rounds. Mm. Uh, uh, blades, shaving blades. Yep. Many I found there on mm. top. S uh, needles and stuff I found there. And all go into one of the legs of the bed. And with that I could do something. Uh, the ball in the toilet can, can serve as a water bottle. You know, yep. if you air inside, water bottle. But then you are always uh, faced with the possibility, how do you know you break out tonight and you're not going to be released tomorrow? Once you break out, you've got to flee. And you've got to flee very far. My idea was to flee to the port, not away from, from them, but into the midst of, of the city and then down in the port and, and stow, stow away on the ship. Uh, probably end up in Portugal or a place like that. But that was my plan. Uh, eventually, uh, it did not happen. I did not escape. Uh, I took old bread and put it so it can dry out in sunlight to make the biscuits. It tasted like shit, but anyway, I, I did that. And one day, you received a visit from a fairly mysterious French fellow. Yeah, actually in 1986 already I, uh, I received this visit by the Frenchman and they did not explain to me why he was there. Uh, this Frenchman's name is John Yves Olivier. And uh, uh, we did not meet uh, at the prison. It took me to a, 
to a sort of a guest house, put me up there. And the Frenchman came in and uh, we checked and uh, he did not really introduce himself. And he just said, I'm a friend of your people. And he asked me how I was, uh, how I feel, what I experienced, etc. And he uh, gave me a letter for my wife. And uh, while I was there, he gave me paper and a pen to, to, to reply. And uh, I, I wrote a, a, a quick reply there to my wife. Uh, he's now going back to South Africa. He's going to, to take it uh, to the family. And then when I got to give the pen back to him, he said, no, keep it. But it's quite an expensive pen. Even, you know, uh, um, yeah, an uh, 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 ink pen, but a golden mm. uh, spray pen. Uh, uh, probably if you have to buy that pen now, it will be in the vicinity of around about 2,000 US. That's an expensive pen. Yeah. He later explained, they gave me the pen as a token that he want to do something for me. That's what he said. Well, and then he left. Uh, I was quite confused because here is this Frenchman. Uh, I don't understand why, what is his interest. But still, it sparkles a bit of hope that yes, at least there is somebody coming from somewhere who is going back to South Africa or is going to South Africa who now uh, has taken an interest in, in, in the situation. Because you, you, you don't hear anything. You don't know if, if anything is being done. Mm. All I know is that uh, the government has rejected my existence and that I am part of the South African army and that type of normal procedure. Then, exactly a year later, he popped up again. And that day, he had another guy with him, a guy called Dion Erasmus. He was a medical doctor, but he's also a special forces operator. And, but he was with me in Gabinda. And we did the operation, but he stayed in the boats. So he wasn't part of the shore party. And here, Dion is with him. Dion standing in the door, looking at me and I look at him, I recognized him immediately. But I realized also, listen, Dion, fuck, he was, he was with us there in, uh, in Cabinda. I, I, if I recognize you here, they will come and ask me, from where do you recognize that guy? He said, you will end up in prison as well. That worried them. When they came back to South Africa, they said, they don't know whether I have recognized it. But the Frenchman asked me, did you recognize him? I said, yes. But somehow that wasn't related. That was about 10 days before I was released. Uh, and uh, I was uh, watching television one Sunday evening. I got a small black and white television just outside the cell. So I was watching it. And I saw there they explained that uh, as far as I can understand from the little bit of Portuguese I know at that stage is that uh, I'm I'm going to be released. I'm going to exchange for prisoners. And I called the Cuban guard because I was speaking more Spanish than Portuguese. And I asked him, what are they saying there? And he confirms to me, he said to me, tomorrow you are going home. So now I can't sleep. Mm. I'm waiting now for this magic moment that's going to happen tomorrow morning. <coughs> the next day nothing happens. Nothing happens. Everything is as normal. I didn't know what was going on. Yes, and uh, my pulse rate was up. And exactly 12 o'clock, I heard footsteps. And then the uh, base commander, the Cuban base commander, was standing in the door. He said, Captain, your time is come. You are going home. And then quickly they cut my, my hair and my beard and gave me clothes to put on. And then I left the cell into a car for the first time. I wasn't cuffed. Then I get into the car, taken to the airport. I had to make a television statement there for the Angolan television. And uh, then I was led to a plane, uh, put on the plane. The plane belonged to the, the Angolan president, uh, a Gulfstream. And uh, inside was John Eves. 
and then we we chat as we took off uh, from Luanda. We flew to uh, to Maputo, uh, and in Maputo I was exchanged for 132 FAPLA soldiers, and Pierre Albertini, a Frenchman, and Klaus, the young uh, Dutchman, who was being held for weapon smuggling in South Africa, and so. It was quite a large exchange of prisoners. So you flew in, was it daytime or nighttime? Or? It was supposed to be daytime, but I, I, we touched down in Maputo just as the sun was setting. Yeah. Uh, at that stage, we were already supposed to have exchanged. Uh, the South African uh, uh, Air Force has already scrambled their mirages to intercept the Angolan plane in case they're going to miss the landing so they did a lot of contingency planning to prevent them from flying back to Angola. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so, so you, you land, you, you look out, the sun's going down at, this, at the Maputo and Mozambique, the airport there, and you said uh, 130 plus prisoners getting exchanged, were they at the airport as well? Yeah, they, they flew in with a, with a Boeing from South Africa. Yeah. They landed there, they were sitting on that side of the tarmac, I was sitting on this side, and then all the other exchange planes somewhere and uh, we spent a long long time at the airport as the final documents was being signed and uh, 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 speeches was delivered and uh, then eventually it was long after dark I had to walk from the Angolan Gulf Stream uh, towards the, the other side of, of the, the tarmac where the South African president's plane was parked and uh, halfway we crossed the Angolan prisoners going that way and me going uh, to the South African side. What is that? There was a grasshopper. Oh, there is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, from there we, we flew actually to Cape Town here. And uh, I saw the state president that night at about half past 12. So, so uh, you've, you've gone from within the space of a few hours, you've gone from a little solitary confinement cell with black and white TV through a through a cage yeah. door to going on one president's golf stream to another president's Boeing or something or other and then right down uh, to his house here in Cape Town yeah uh, where I was met by him and several ministers and uh, I, I made a little speech to the press uh, and then he, uh, the president asked the, them if they have any questions and each and every hand goes up. And he looked at them and said, oh, no questions, let's go. So we went through to his office and uh, they asked me what, if I want to, to, to drink something. I said, yes, I would like a brandy. And I, I drank my first brandy after I was released with the president of South Africa. What were you, your emotions at this point? Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, it's undescribable. Uh, I mean, from the moment I, 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 I stepped out of the prison in Angola until I, after I, I've met P.W. Uh, Boeta, uh, was one high. And the next day was hectic as, as well. I met my family at the hospital the day after they operated and took this pin out. And then about a week later, I couldn't remember anything. It was like a, a computer that had received too much input over too short a period of time and it just shuts off. I started remembering my homecoming again after about three months. Things started getting back. Oh, that's what we did and there we were. Um, and it was quite hectic. Mm. But uh, I can tell you, uh, it, it's a great feeling when you, you were uh, in prison and, and, and you came out and you came back to your country and I was very well received by the president, by the government and by all the people of South Africa because this whole process was broadcast for a full day as, as the, uh, the steps, as we arrived in, Ma in Maputo, as we left Maputo, it was broadcast live to, to oh, South okay. Africa. So, I mean, you were given the quintessential hero's welcome, I suppose. Did you feel like a hero? No. And I couldn't understand what was happening. Yeah. That was a difficult thing 
for me. Uh, because all the previous guys that was captured was flown back to South Africa or pushed across the border. One guy was exchanged in Germany for a Russian. But not a lot of press coverage. Just sort of reporting that the guy they are back. Mm. And here I came and they make this very, very large propaganda thing out of it. Uh, of course they wanted probably the mileage out of it. Uh, but I discuss uh, some of my theories in, in, in the books that I've uh, written uh, since. Uh, so yeah, yeah, uh, it pretty much put me on the map. Mm. But then for years, I have gone uh, quiet, almost underground, as I uh, lived my own life and struggled to overcome the problems that sprout out of this incident. Uh, farming in, a, in, in Namibia, farming here, farming in Namibia. Then I went back to Angola uh, with executive outcomes. Then I remained behind. I farmed in Angola, lived there for six, seven years. Uh, came back to South Africa and uh, I was very confused of sort of between the countries. Uh, and I couldn't find my feet. Was, was that Probably. the main thing that that incarceration period did to you? Did it leave yes. you unsettled? Uh, yes, it did. Uh, for example, I, I spent two and a half years in prison. Mm. And from there on, my life took on uh, uh, two and a half year cyclists. So for two and a half years I will be here doing this. Then something will happen. Then I spend another two and a half years doing that and that will stop. And then something else. My whole life turned up to be broken up in short periods of two and a half years. Mm. Uh, and that must have been a psychological thing, which I only broke in 2011 when I went to the Congo. But it was while I was farming in the Congo that I was invited to attend the, the 25th anniversary of the signage of the Brazzaville Protocol. Okay, quickly explain what the original Brazzaville Protocol was. Yeah. I only find out that there exists something like the Brazzaville Protocol uh, in, uh, in 2014. But the Brazzaville Protocol was not advocated uh, in South Africa. The people was not informed about it. But the Brazzaville Protocol was where the end of the war was decided how they was going to end the war. That was the initial uh, planning phases for how they are going to do it. The end of the war, the withdrawal of the Cubans, the withdrawal of the South Africans, independence of Namibia, which was preconditioned for the release of Nelson Mandela. If you look at the plot for peace, which was that day's uh, premiere, a plot for peace was on that celebration day of the signage, the 25th anniversary of the protocol. Uh, then you can see how they have gone through the planning phases and that the whole process only stopped after Nelson Mandela was released. Okay, now just for listeners, plot for peace is a, a film about the role of Jean-Yves Olivier. Exactly, yeah. about his life. Okay. But I never knew it until I saw it. I never knew about the Brazzaville Protocol until I, in the Congo, in Brazzaville, learned about, about it and where the first appellation was the release of prisoners. And that's when everything sorts of, all the, all the missing pieces of the puzzle started falling into place. That's when I realized that our operation in Cabinda was a setup to create a platform, a vehicle for the nego negotiations of peace, of the end of the war. That's where I finally realized what was the issue. 
why we had to wait for everything to fall into place, why we must be isolated, why we had to spend the day ashore, why we have to be on the eastern side of the installation. So you're saying... They wanted prisoners to be taken. While I was in prison, during one of my wife's visits, she was uh, hosted by the Congo government. At that stage, still the, the uh, um, uh, popular republic of the Congo. What does they have to do with the war in Angola? What does they have to do with a prisoner of war, a South African prisoner of war, or a soldier that is being kept in prison in Angola? But they hosted her. They drove her around in the embassy car. They uh, accommodated her and provided her with food for the world stay. And it's only after 2014 that they realized the role that Brazil Congo has played in the end of the war with the negotiations. This was where the plans was made. And all of a sudden it sounds as if I was part of Plot for Peace. I was part of this whole process and I didn't even know it. I received the, the National Order of Merit of the Congo on, on that evening of the 25th anniversary of the Brazzaville Protocol from the President of the Congo for the little role I played in the release of Nelson Mandela. And I was only a prisoner. I, I was in prison. I did not even know what was going on. So this was a whole a planned operation. So just let me, to be clear, part of the, if you look at the sort of the political, uh, the geopolitics at play, um, the, the writing was on the wall for South Africa, the demise of apartheid, they had, things had to change. Part of that was the release of Nelson Mandela. Is yes, right? but the, the problem with South Africa was that the process was being pushed ripe. It wasn't necessary at that stage to do it. Contrary to the now very popular belief, we never fought a war against the ANC or the Mkontu Bishiswe. They were never in the trenches in Angola. They never fought there. They were trained there, but they never fought. They refused to fight. We should have fought the ANC then we would have had a better position in South Africa today than we, are, than we have now. But, yes, I wouldn't say that uh, 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 we couldn't continue as it was. We could have continued for another 10, 15 years easily. Mm. But the politics played it out that the time is right, that it must be done. I don't want to say a lot about the yeah. politics. We lost, the, uh, we, we won the war, we won the battles, but we lost the overall war from a military perspective. Okay. Because eventually politics lost the war for us. But we could have continued. Okay, so part of the deal was that there was a, there was a big push to have Mandela released. But if we read between the lines, or more explicitly, saying that, okay, well, let's get, let's have some sort of prisoner exchange to be part of that. Well, let's, let's look at the facts. PW was not against the release of Mandela, PW Bota. But he said the conditions must be right. Yep. And he said that at, at that stage, it was not yet Right. PW did not know about our operation in Cabinda. He was extremely angry when he found out after the news became known that we have been captured, or I have been captured. Now you must go to back to my very first question, why select the American target? PV's only support was the Americans. Then he lost the support. Mm. 
So was that a, a quasi-decision made by someone in the effort to push PW to resign? Because very shortly after I was released, he did resign. And FW came into power. And within six months, he announced the release of Nelson Mandela. That period was too fast, too quickly, according to me and many others. Mm. That should have been a more prolonged process. But it was as if they were chasing a date somewhere in 1994. It must happen before that or. What is the or? And, and part of one of the first steps had to be the loss of American support to precipitate these... Well, that was a way <coughs> to put pressure on PW to, pressure on. to change. Yep. That's what I'm aiming at with my first two books. Judas Bok and U.S. of Skleet, where I explain the operation and everything that we have talked about now, explain in a lot of detail what I think happened. But then again, you must ask the question, how certain w uh, were they that, that, that they will take an, uh, have a prisoner taken? Yeah, sure. But because of the isolation, they wanted to take the whole group prisoner because that would have given them so much more power to negotiate instead of only one or two. Fortunately, in this scenario, I was... Uh, a very senior captain in the Special Forces. But there was a backup operation that has been planned and we were executed on the very same night and that was the attack on the Air Force base at Menonk where the people had to infiltrate the base to sabotage the planes. After watching it for months, all of a sudden, that specific night, all the guards, personnel, was not doubled, but tripled. They were swarming that base. So one of the operations was supposed to deliver a prisoner, preferably the whole group as prisoners. Did that operation go ahead, the airfield one? It did. Okay. But they abandoned it. The moment they noticed this unusual activities, they abandoned the attack. So. Look, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big accusation. You're, you're, you're basically saying that someone in your people government, don't like what I'm saying. Yeah, has has basically shopped you, has betrayed you. In fact, the name of your your book here, and we'll talk about it in a moment, Judas Goat, which I found fascinating when I when I looked up what it meant. So, do you want to explain what what that means, um, and in the context of of what we've been talking about? At the abattoir, when they uh, the, the farmers' trucks arrive with the sheep to be slaughtered. They are offloaded in a pen. And then through a little false door, a big goat comes in. And then this goat walks in front of the sheep and all the sheep follow this goat through a, you know, like a walkway, until the pen where they are being slaughtered. They got another false door and he go out that door. That's called the Judas goat. He's leading the sheep to the slaughterhouse. And I'm saying that this operation was to lead the people of South Africa to the slaughterhouse. So you've published the book. You've been quite outspoken about, about what you believe. Um, some people don't like it. Some people ag agree with you. Uh, how has it changed your life? I made a lot of enemies in the process, uh, but it's more the people that don't, don't want to hear that anything like this could have happened in the previous times. So there's many examples of things that went wrong and uh, which was done wrong. Uh, and it was much easier to blame the failure of this world operation on me. So for 30 years I walked around until I, by accident, were invited to the 25th anniversary of the signage of the Brasable Protocol and here I learned what has happened. 
And then after 30 years, I realized that I'm not solely to blame for the failure of that operation. Because very easy to say, but it's his fault, it's his mistake. He was the, the mission commander, he made the wrong decisions. But then was, all of a sudden, the questions about why I make their decisions become clear. And that's when I decided to write these two books. Were you bitter at all for a period of time? No, I'm not bitter. I mean, it's too many years. Yeah. It's already passed. Uh, remember, if I look back at my life now, and uh, many times I'm, uh, I'm being asked by youngsters uh, uh, where they ask me if, if I had to relive my life, is there anything I would want to take out of my life? I said no. Because if I've taken anything out, then I wouldn't have been who I am now. I needed all that to be Wayne the Tway today. Because the problems and the obstacles in your life uh, define who you become and who you are now. So for, for me that, that is important. So I cannot be bitter about it. Uh, no, there's too many positive things around us. We are alive, must uh -huh. carry on, be thankful, grateful for everything. Uh, but these two books also opened a new door for me. Uh, these books went so well, I sold a tremendous large number of, of the book. Uh, so that uh, the people say, but they, they like to read in the style. So I wrote another book about submarines, by the way. That went down well, and I wrote another book and another one. Now there is already seven books. In two and a half years since I started writing, I'm living solely from the income of my books. Again, that is not something that you seldomly see happening. I talk to people about this experience, but not about the negative things, but about the fact that ad adverse situations, problems, obstacles, is not necessarily a bad thing in your life. We all have problems. We all experience obstacles. There's not one person in the world that don't experience problems of the one or another kind. But life is not supposed to be easy. Life is supposed to exist out of obstacles and problems which you must overcome to become the person that you will be one day. If that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Look, that's a positive note to wrap up, Feynman. Um, but before we do, let's quickly make sure, if, if ever this makes the video, normally I do the the audio version first, but it's called Judas Goat. This is the first book. This is the first one, yes. Um, which describes, as we say, the operation in, in great detail. Where can people get this? Uh, well, it's, a, it's, it's available in most bookshops in South Africa. Yep. Uh, or they can order it directly for me, which the, then I will personalize it and sign it for them. And the email address is MRSFDT, which stands for Mrs. Francis de Tway. Okay. <laughs> at gmail.com. That was my wife's uh, idea. Oh, very good. Yeah. Mrs. FDT, uh, Francis de Toy, MRS, FDT, at gmail.com. Uh, um, what about an e version? An electronic uh, version? There is an electronic version on uh, www.cobo.com. Uh, Kobo with a K. Kobo with okay, a K. Okay, I'll, yes. I'll make sure those links go up as well on the on the website okay. where people can download the podcast. And, and, and then, of course, my own website uh, is also there, uh, uh, just vainandertoy.com. Perfect. Vainand, thank you so much. It's a fascinating it's a, story. It's a pleasure. I hope uh, uh, that answer, answers all your questions, but I. Th there's such a lot that we can talk about. Oh, I'm sure. We can probably fill another two, three programs. Well, maybe, right maybe another podcast in the future. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.